And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. I'm Gary McDade, the speaker for the program. Thank you so much for being with us. In our time today, we're going to take a look at the subject of the rapture, and we're going to look at why they teach the rapture. And we will cover this point along five fronts. Now, for the benefit of those of you who may not know or may not have had much interest in the study of the rapture, I'd like for you to just know what it is by definition, as defined by those who teach it. The rapture is the idea that one day, and they will say one day soon, they've been saying that for about 40 years, Christ is going to silently return and take all the righteous people up to heaven. And the reason they give for the rapture is because after the rapture, there will be seven years of horrific tribulation in the earth. And so one is used to justify the other. That is, the rapture is used to prove the tribulation, and the tribulation is used to prove the rapture. Neither of these concepts are found in the Bible. I want to begin today by noticing with you that the subject of the rapture, while it is something that has been being used by religious people, is a concept and a term that is not found in the Bible. Now, we could do this two ways. We could get a concordance, and we could type in the word rapture or look it up in one of the books, and you'll not find rapture in Old or New Testaments. Another way to do that is to go to one of the leading proponents of this view known as premillennialism, in which you have the rapture, and then you have a seven-year period of tribulation, and then that is to be followed by a thousand-year literal reign of Jesus Christ here on earth in the city of Jerusalem from the throne of David for only a thousand years. Those are the essential elements of the premillennial viewpoint. Now, Hal Lindsey is a premillennialist, and on page 137 of his book, known as The Late Great Planet Earth, he states that the rapture is not in the Bible. So that's the second way I wanted to prove to you that rapture is not in the Bible. He will even say, don't go looking for your con concordance and grab your concordance looking for re revelation because it's not in the Bible. Well, it's not there, neither is the concept. Have you thought of what happens when people teach and believe something that they know and will affirm is not in the Bible? Have you thought of what happens when you do that? You've set aside the Bible. And now you're dependent upon Hal Lindsey and his followers, people today like John Hagee, Dr. David Jeremiah, and there are many others. These are just some examples. You're now dependent upon them for an understanding of the rapture because, as they will tell you, it's not in the Bible. Hal Lindsey said that when he wrote this book, guess what, in 1970. So they know it's not in the Bible, yet they continue to promote it. Now, as you would know, if you've been watching this program for any period of time, we believe the Bible, and we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Moreover about the Bible, we believe this, unlike most people. We believe that it contains all things necessary to life and godliness. That's in 2 Peter 1.3. Everything from the plan of salvation to the terms of membership for the church to the description of the church, the organization of the church, that is the leadership of the church, the mission of the church, how the church functions, everything necessary to life and godliness, how the members of the church are to live their daily lives, everything is right here in the Bible, 2 Peter 1.3. In that, we differ from the rapture people, just to make that clear. Now, I will have a passage of scripture I'd like to use as a theme verse for our study today. It's found in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1, 7, please notice carefully what the Apostle John wrote. He said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Look at Revelation 1, 7. With it, we have destroyed this concept known as the rapture. The rapture has been a popular idea. It was first mentioned in our generation in a popular way by Hal Lindsey. And then in more recent times, Dr. Tim LaHaye, another fellow named Jenkins, wrote a book together, and it was called the Left Behind series. There were several books written. In fact, those books sold over 80 million copies. So it was wildly popular in that arena. A movie was made about it called Left Behind, 
But the movie was not nearly as popular. It only grossed about $4 million. These people are certainly money motivated, aren't they? Why, yes. That's one reason they teach what they do. We talk about why the rapture. That's, that's one reason we won't cover in our discussion today. But I just wanted you to see that with this one passage here in Revelation 1-7, we have exploded the concept of the rapture because it says, Behold, he, Jesus Christ, cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. When it says every eye, it means every eye. And that is certainly emphasized by what you have in they that pierced him. He's speaking about those at the crucifixion of Christ. Those who pierced him were not righteous people. But according to the Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, they will see Christ when he returns. We'll look at how a little later on in our study. But I want you to know, every eye sees him. Not a silent return. Not a return for only the righteous, leaving the wicked befuddled. But no, every eye will see Christ when he returns. Now, having set aside biblically and destroyed the viewpoint known as the rapture, and with it all of premillennialism in one single passage of Scripture, let's look at five reasons why they teach the rapture today. Reason number one is to scare people into church. This has been a leading reason that has been used across the years. I remember as a boy in school, sometimes kids would come and they'd say, man, you're not going to believe what they talked about at our church last night. I would say, what? And they would say, Christ is going to come back and take some of us and leave some of us. It's going to be a state of chaos. There's going to be a tribulation. And they were scared. The idea of those pastors was to scare people into church. Now, let me show you the contrast with what the Bible teaches about how people become followers of Christ. Let's just look to Jesus for this. All right, in John chapter 12, in verse 32, Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what we teach in churches of Christ. That is, as you've seen, that is not what the rapture people teach. How are they drawn? Jesus had earlier commented upon that in the sixth chapter of John's gospel. This will be John chapter 6, verse 44. He says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. That's John 6, 44 and 45. Nobody can come to God unless he's drawn by God. And the way and the manner in which he's drawn by God is by the teaching of the word of God, even as so saith the prophets. John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45. I know that the rapture people think, well, what's the harm in saying, well, let's just scare people to death and see if we can get them interested in the things of God. I'll tell you the harm in it. It's not what the Bible teaches. The loving Savior died on Calvary's cross to draw men unto him by that sacrifice, not to be like a uh, cowboy with a bullwhip and whip the cows into shape and drive them in a direction. That's what the rapture people love to do. It's unbiblical, my friends. So I'm giving you that as the first reason why they teach the rapture. They, they're motivated by saying, well, it'll scare people to church. It is true that people today are very indifferent. In fact, Across the years of my life, I'm shocked that people in our time are so indifferent toward the things of God. It's always been the case that people were indifferent. You could find people indifferent to the things of God. But the majority of people today seem so indifferent to the teaching of the Bible and the things of God. It's really a tragedy. Now, that's another reason, incidentally, why I'm thrilled to be able to come to you on radio and television preaching and teaching the gospel in this way to reach more people. And we appreciate all those individuals and churches of Christ who support this program. Thank you so much for that. A second reason I want to look at as to why they teach the rapture. In order to advance this theme, they teach the rapture in order to take advantage of people. That's right. In the book of Jude, we read in Jude 16 that that's been a characteristic of false teachers from the very beginning. The apostle Jude wrote this, their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Men's persons in admiration because of advantage. In other words, 
taking advantage of people. I would submit in proof of this observation that we know more of the names of false teachers who teach the rapture than we know details of the rapture itself. I mentioned Hal Lindsey. I mentioned John Hagee. I mentioned Dr. David Jeremiah. There are many, many others who teach the rapture. What do they do? They advance themselves. As I said a minute ago, when you're teaching something you know that's not in the Bible, people are going to have to listen to you because you're you. You've convinced them that you know something they can't learn in the Bible. And that is why they like to do that. They take advantage of people. That is why they teach the rapture. Well, you say now, how do you say they take advantage of people? Well, I've mentioned, haven't I? The millions of copies of the Left Behind series. That's just one book that has been printed. 80 million copies. Can you imagine the estate that Tim LaHaye left when he died? Because he left it all. Can you imagine the money that has been made by books like Hal Lindsey has written? It's been copied or reprinted hundreds of times. It's amazing to see the amount of money these people make. They're taking advantage of people. They're not telling you just go to your Bible and read and you'll find out about the rapture. Because they know you can't do it. It is not in there. In fact, I think it's interesting that sometimes they'll point to 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and they'll say, oh, that passage teaches the rapture. The silent return of Christ is taught in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Are you kidding? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 16, it is talking about the second coming of Christ, but it is certainly not talking about it like the rapture people talk about it, a silent return of Christ. I think it is correctly described as the loudest verse in the Bible. Watch it. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. At the second coming of Christ, it's not going to come in a silent way. He's not going to return silently. He'll come fully announced with the trump of God, with a shout. So the very verse that they often point to is the loudest verse in the New Testament and certainly belies the fact that there's going to be a silent, unknown return of Christ for the wicked, known only to the righteous. No, every eye will see him. Remember Revelation 1 in verse 7. And now let's go to a third reason. A third reason that they teach the rapture is to abuse the book of Revelation. That's right. I'm using the word abuse because they have always said, where do you get this idea of a rapture preceding seven years of tribulation? And they say, well, it's in the book of Revelation. We've made an extensive study of the book of Revelation, not simply reading it, but studying it and teaching it over the years. And in doing so, we have not found a correlation between the rapture and the tribulation as taught by the premillennialists and the book of Revelation. It just does not teach it like they do. Now, here's what they say. And I'll show you this. I think I can show you this pretty quickly. And I have to be kind of quick because we've only got a limited amount of time. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, there are 70 prophetic weeks mentioned. Let's go there just for a minute. Daniel chapter 9. Now, since this is some of the more difficult teaching of the Bible, I will just spend a moment on it and summarize. Concerning these 70 weeks, Daniel tells you the beginning point. The release, the decree of Cyrus to release the captives. We're in Old Testament now, and we're in the centuries before the coming of Christ. There are seven identifiers connected with the 70 weeks that are mentioned in this passage of Scripture. Let's detail these seven marks. Seventy weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city, speaking of Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, number one, and to make an end of sins, that's number two, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, that's number three, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, that's number four, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, number five, and to anoint the most holy, that's number six. Now, that is the first week and then 62 following weeks. So now we've got a total of 63 weeks. Come down to the last verse of the book, of the chapter, this is 9.27 in Daniel, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, what will be the purpose of this? 
it will be, In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So there are six identifying marks associated with the first 63 weeks, and then in the seventh, the last week, the last set week that stands for seven years, what's he going to do? Confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, in the Bible, we understand that a prophecy of a week, a day, stands for a year. And then you'll notice with this seven days of this one week, what do you have? Seven years. Well, we understand that. And that's the way the Bible teaches. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. Look at this. One week. What's going to happen then? The sacrifice is going to cease. The overspreading of, of abomination will make desolate. desolate. Now, Jesus tells us what that is. That's the destruction of Jerusalem, Matthew 24, 15. Why is Jerusalem destroyed? Because after Christ confirmed the covenant, in the middle of that week, it's, he's cut off. The ministry of Christ was three and a half years, the middle of that week, the middle of that seven years. That is what Daniel 9, 27 is talking about. He's not pointing out to sometime millennia later. He's talking about pointing out to the time of the coming of Christ in his personal ministry. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross explains each of the seven signals right here in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. These having been fulfilled, the book of Daniel is now standing fulfilled with the completion of the work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Notice, to anoint the most holy. And that's what happens when he ascends on high in Acts chapter 2 and is seated at God's right hand on his throne over his kingdom. In chapter 9 and verse 27, the covenant confirmed for one week. Now, here's what the premillennialists all say. It's not pointing just to the coming of Christ. They point it beyond that, 2,000 years beyond that. And now today, they're all talking about, oh, Daniel chapter 9 is going to be fulfilled. The last week of this prophecy can now begin. When you start a prophetic time clock, it doesn't stop ticking. But all the premillennialists say this prophetic time clock was put on hold when Christ was rejected by the Jews. Do you know what they actually teach? And all of them do it. They say that, yes, the Lord intended that Christ would come and that he would be crucified, that he would be raised from the dead, and he would set up his kingdom. But since he was rejected by the Jews, God couldn't give him his kingdom. He had to set up the church as an afterthought, an emergency measure. And the church never was in the mind of God from the beginning, which Ephesians 3, 8 through 11 tells you it was in the mind of God from eternity past. That is, the church was. And so what they say is this last week is going to be fulfilled later on in time. The prophetic time clock stopped because Jesus didn't know he's going to be rejected by the Jews. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, we've read Isaiah, or rather Psalm 22. We've read Isaiah 53. And we know that Jesus was to be despised and rejected of men. That was written before Daniel was written. And yet they play on your sympathy to say, oh, surprise, surprise. Jesus didn't know he was going to be rejected of the Jews. Yes, he did. And the Bible foretold that. That's just part of the way they get their scheme into it, this rapture scheme. They have to abuse the scripture in general, just like they abuse the book of Revelation in particular. Now, let me show you how they do that. They will say that, well, this was never fulfilled, but indeed it was. Confirming the covenant with many for one week, in the midst of the week, the sacrifice and oblation is ceasing. Why? Because Christ died for our sins. No more animal sacrifices would be necessary. Christ's sacrifice would take care of all of that. And then the abomination of desolation the rejection of Christ will end with, will mean the end of the Jewish system. That's what Jesus talked about, Matthew 24, verse 15. All right, here's what they say. This week of Daniel 9 was never fulfilled. And what happened was God took it and moved it over to the book of Revelation, and he dropped that week into the last book of the Bible. And so the tribulation is in Revelation. Now, tribulation is in Revelation but not seven years of tribulation as said by the people that are premillennialists. No, sir. They say there's a week here in the book of Revelation. That's where you'll find it, is in the book of Revelation. I've heard that 
all my adult life, that that week is now in the book of Revelation. Well, now here's the way that you can see this the quickest since our time is so precious. In the book of Revelation, you certainly have days and you have months that are mentioned when you're accounting for time. You will have a series or a number of months. There are also years. You're familiar with the thousand years that are mentioned for those beheaded in Revelation chapter 20. But do you know what's not in the book of Revelation? What you cannot find in the book of Revelation? You cannot find a week or weeks in the book of Revelation. Now, don't you think that's interesting? That the Holy Spirit protected the book of Revelation from abuse of those who'd want to take that last week of Daniel 9 and say it never was fulfilled. Let's put it out yonder somewhere. And let's put it in the book of Revelation. Oh, it's in the book of Revelation. You will not find week or weeks in the book of Revelation. That's the simplest way for me to show you that this is a false teaching. Week is not in the book of Revelation, nor weeks. I think that is remarkable to see that when you turn to the book of Revelation. Now, we could spend the time to study through the book of Revelation and see its meaning and how it is appropriately understood. But you'll never find it to have a rapture. You'll never find it to have only seven years of tribulation, after which time a millennial kingdom on earth is established. It's not in the book, ladies and gentlemen. It is not there. So I want you to know that about this idea of the rapture. It is a concept foreign to the scripture. So is this week that Daniel is supposed to have put over here into the book of Revelation. It simply is not there. Why do they teach the rapture? To abuse the book of Revelation. And then a fourth reason that I'd like to cover with you about why they teach the rapture. They teach the rapture to reject the New Testament teaching on the gospel plan of salvation and the importance of the church. Now, I've already alluded to this some, but I want you to know that in the New Testament, we have indeed a plan of salvation. There are steps of faith that a person is to take to be acceptable to God. We'll just look at the book of Romans to prove this. In Romans 4.12, we must walk in steps of faith, just like Abraham did. Romans 4.12. These are five steps that must be taken. We must take the step of hearing because by it, hearing the word of God, faith comes. Romans 10 at verse 17. We're to take the step of repentance from past sins. Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We are to take the step of confession of faith in Christ with the mouth. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And we are to take the step of baptism into Christ to be buried with Christ and to be risen to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. At which time the Lord adds us to his church. Acts 2, 47. It's called the churches of Christ salute you. Romans 16, 16. Now the people teach the rapture to reject this plan of salvation. None of them believe it. They don't believe that's what's to be taught. They think you teach the rapture and the tribulation and the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth. No, you're to teach that gospel plan of salvation. Have you ever considered this, that in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 at verse 21, the Bible says to us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The church is the instrument of God's glory in this old world. Now, the rapture people, they don't believe that. They teach the rapture in order to reject the gospel plan of salvation right here in our New Testament and the New Testament teaching about the church of Christ. And then one final point in the lesson is yours. They teach the rapture to alter what the Bible says about the second coming of Christ. There's no mistaking this. We've already given the passage in Revelation 1-7. That is sufficient to show you. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Every eye sees Christ at his return. They teach the rapture to alter what the Bible says about the second coming of Christ. Let me give you another passage that will look a little bit more thoroughly into that. In John chapter 5, Verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour, mark it down, 
H-O-U-R, the hour cometh, when all that would be the righteous and the wicked, when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of condemnation, or the King James Version says damnation, righteous and wicked, raised from the dead in the same H-O-U-R, same hour. So why do they teach the rapture? They teach the rapture to alter what the New Testament teaches about the second coming of Christ. Now, there are many other verses. I've given you 1 Thessalonians 4 at verse 16 previously in our study today. And you see that when Christ returns, he comes with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. We've seen that the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. There is no rapture taught in the Bible. They teach it for these reasons, to scare people into church. They teach it to take advantage of people. They teach it also to abuse the book of Revelation, and they freely do that. They teach it to reject what the Bible says about the gospel plan of salvation and the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. And they teach it very clearly to alter what the Bible says about the second coming of Christ. Now, with these things in mind, why would anyone want to believe the rapture? Why fall into the pitfall that is laid out before us by false teachers? You'll see how Lindsay back now, back on TV. You hear him on the radio. He's back on YouTube teaching the same things. He taught that the rapture was going to occur in this book, written and printed in 1970. He taught the rapture will occur in it in 1988. That's right here in this book. Did the rapture occur in 1988? Well, no, it did not. That makes him a false teacher. Moses said if a prophet prophesies something, it does not come to pass. He is a false teacher. Don't listen to him. That's Deuteronomy chapter 18. Well, I stand with Moses on that and offer that same recommendation for you today is do not accept the teaching of the rapture and of premillennialism by all these people. John Hagee is very vocal in that regard. Now, none of these people have ever come forward to discuss any of these topics. They know I'll present many of the same verses that I've presented here today for your edification. They are teaching something that people believe because of having people's persons in admiration, because of advantage. They'll do that for people that will follow them. They do not teach it to be evaluated based upon the Bible as we've done here today. Well, let me close by thanking you for your kind attention today to the study. I hope that we will be prepared for the return of Christ by following the gospel plan of salvation and obeying it by serving him faithfully in his church. We thank you for your time and attention. We pray that all is well with you, and we hope you'll return to be with us here at your earliest convenience as we study from the Bible right here on the Everlasting Gospel. Thank you for being with us today. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him.